Hello everyone and welcome to today's Television Education Network webinar. For technical assistance, please contact Redback Support on 1800 733 416 or to listen to this video webinar through your phone instead, the dial-in number and passcode is listed below this video player. This video webinar is live and interactive. We ask you to participate by posting questions to the presenter by clicking on the dark blue hand icon located on the top right hand corner of your screen. And finally, today's webinar materials can be accessed by clicking on the light blue arrow icon also located at the top right hand corner of your screen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Amy Sue, a senior associate from Matthews Bowlby Lawyers, and I'm very pleased to have been invited to present this TV ed presentation on choosing the right trust for your client's estate plan. As this is a live recorded um, presentation, I'm happy to take the que any questions at the end of the presentation, but certainly feel free to send through any questions, and if I have time, I'll answer them at the end. Now, in my many years of practice in this area, I've done lots of estate plans for all types of people, from all walks of life, be it high net worth individuals, simple mum-dad types, blended families, estranged flat families, parents who have a disabled child, basically all sorts of people with different arrangements and in different objectives. And I've seen when may it be appropriate for you to consider whether your client's estate plan should comprise a trust. I thought I'd take the opportunity to provide, uh, to start the presentation with a, with a example of when there was clearly a missed opportunity, when a trust could have been utilised in a client's estate plan. The scenario was this, there was a deceased lady and her estate was worth about 2.5 million. Now for a an estate in Sydney or anywhere in Australia now, with um, due to the rising property prices and how much people are contributing to their superannuation, a two point five million dollar estate is not that out of the, out of the ordinary. She had a traditional will in place, and by that I meant she had three sons. She appointed one one of the sons as executor, and divided her estate equally between her three sons and left their inheritance to them directly. What happened was that at the time of her death, one of her sons was a bankrupt. Now, the solicitor who drafted the will, who was also acting for this son that was the executor on the probate, provided with him some advice that said, all you needed to do was delay obtaining probate and administering this estate until your brother who's the bankrupt comes out of his bankruptcy period, which was three years, and there was two more years to run. The executor son, having received this advice, didn't feel too comfortable and came to us to seek a second opinion. It didn't take very long for us to look at this scenario and provide him with the advice that when a, when a will maker has died, the beneficiary's interest in that estate crystallises or vests from the date of death. You cannot, you cannot get around the bankruptcy rules by merely delaying obtaining the grant of probate or distributing any of his inheritance to him once the bankruptcy period had passed. We gave the executor son that advice. This was all backed up by case law. And he then appropriately contacted his bankrupt brother's uh, credit, uh, trustee in bankruptcy to notify him that the bankrupt was due to come into some assets. The take home point from this is that what's happened is that that family, the two brothers, have now had a falling out. Um, the executor brother was just doing his job. The bankrupt brother felt really sore because he's now missed out on about an $800,000 inheritance. He went to his trustee in bankruptcy instead. So this is clearly an example of where there was a missed opportunity where the lady should have considered whether she put her Put, gave the inheritance to her children in a will incorporating a trust as opposed to a traditional will. So bearing that story in mind, I'll go to what the summary of my presentation will be. First of all, we have to start with, 
what are the why why would people a will maker decide to leave estate assets in a trust rather than leaving directly to the beneficiaries there are obviously pros and cons of doing either way then i'll move on to talking about what are the different types of trusts that can be incorporated in a state plan i'll start with the very standard discretionary type and i'll work through a case scenario and i'll with each example in each scenario, I'll add, add to those facts so that then the standard discretionary type, we're moving more, more towards a hybrid type of trust, which I will then discuss what the differences are and when it might be appropriate to use it or, uh, these different types of trusts. First of all, though, I'll start with, in order to understand which type of trust is appropriate for an estate plan, we have to go back to some basics, which I'll, I'll quickly summarise. We have to understand what advantage, advantages can actually be achieved by using a trust in a will as opposed to leaving directly to a beneficiary. If you leave your assets in a will, via will directly to your beneficiaries, directly to your children, directly to your spouse, it's not very asset protective. And obviously there's a photo there, the assets are going directly to person. It's not very asset protective. They might go into a business, they might go guarantor on some loans, they could go bankrupt. So there's a credit, there's creditor risk there, and this other other head of the asset protection that I talk that I will talk about is the family law risk. So this is about married couple or even de facto partnering up and then they end up separating or divorced, and then there's a dispute over how the matrimonial property should be split. So there's certainly one of the one of the advantages of leaving in a trust is that the assets are left in a trust, it's in a protected structure, the trust is a, uh, the trustee of the trust is a separate legal entity, the beneficiaries do not own those assets. The second advantage of leaving assets in a trust is the tax planning opportunities as well. So those two, those two headings that I've got there, asset protection and tax planning op opportunities, are generally the two main reasons why people when clients come in to see you, you should consider with them and have a conversation with them whether it's appropriate to leave their, leave their assets via their will to a trust or directly to their beneficiaries. I'll quickly run through what um, each of these mean broadly and how it is the case that leaving the assets in a trust can be better, more asset protective, or there's some tax planning opportunities. So the first one I'll start with is obviously the creditor risk. So that goes back to the example, the real live example that came across my desk where um, one of the three sons was actually bankrupt in that estate. Um, now, if, if the trust that you incorporate in a will is a discretionary trust, you are leaving the assets of your estate in a trust, okay? It does not form part of a bankrupt beneficiary's assets. Um, that would be available for distribution between creditors because a discretionary beneficiary, that object only has a mere expectancy that the trustee would consider them for a distribution. They have no fixed entitlement to receive any of those assets that are held in the trust. So generally speaking, assets held in a trust via will are generally good against creditor risk of the beneficiaries, um, provided it's not a sham, a sham and all that. But generally you don't have that apply because it's a will that's been done by the parent and assets that are flowing from the parent's estate. It's not, it's not the, it was never the beneficiary's assets to start with and they've moved them in there when there was a solvency risk. So generally wills incorporating a testamentary trust provided it's discretionary is very good to guard against creditor risk. The second risk though, the family law risk. So this is when there's a dispute between your child and the son-in-law, the ex-daughter-in-law, um, whether, and there's, there's a dispute over what forms part of matrimonial property and how that split of that matrimonial property should be done. Now, family law risk, certainly the family law courts are a lot more fluid in when they look at trust. They actually look at the specific details of the trust instruments. So are very important, who's controlling the trust, who's the trustee, who's the appointor, and they look at who is actually within that beneficiary class. So if you are, if your, your client comes in and tells you that their asset protection in relation to family law, they don't want 
they don't want their son-in-law to make off with half the assets, you know, that you've left them from their inheritance and it's, they want to keep it within the bloodline, some people reference that, um, then if you set up a trust, a testamentary trust, where that child who potentially could be at the family law risk is the sole trustee and also the sole capital beneficiary, they basically have total control. They can decide to pull out all the capital and distribute it to themselves. That is not very asset protective from a family law risk, all right, um, because the family law courts will really look at the substance of it, who's controlling it and who's within the beneficiary class. So I've made reference to a case here, a recent case, only 2019 family law, family law case called Bernard and Bernard. And the scenario in this case was that the father was the one that's died. He had a son and a daughter. The son was the one that was going through divorce and there was an argument by his ex-wife that the assets that the dad had left in the trust in favour of the son and his family should be part of matrimonial property. Now, what the father had was a will. He didn't leave it directly to the son and daughter. That would not have worked at all from a family law risk, obviously. Um, but he's left two trusts, one for the benefit of the son and his family and one for the benefit of the sister and her family. But interestingly, on the son's trust, he was not a trustee or an appointor. It was his sister that was the sole trustee of his trust. And in that case, when an argument came up as to whether the assets held in, a, in the trust that, was, that came from the father's estate, whether that formed part of matrimonial property, the family law court said positively, no, it doesn't form part of matrimonial property because he may be a beneficiary, but he's got no control over what his sister, who is the sole trustee, does. So that's, that's, that case there is a win for, um, you know, estate planning lawyers there. But it really, you know, part, what the focus of this presentation will be as I go through each of these different factual scenarios that I'll go through with you is that it really depends on the details of the trust. So in order to be able to counter that family law risk, we've really got to tailor the control and beneficiary class, uh, class provisions of the trust deed. So all trusts are not created equally. Um, and we've really got to tailor those provisions if your client tells you that family law risk is a key objective for them to achieve. The second, the second advantage of trust, potentially, leaving, leaving your kid's inheritance in a trust is the tax planning opportunities that it provides. Now, ta these tax planning opportunities, they would apply to normal discretionary trusts anyway. So by these, I mean intervivos trusts that have been established during somebody's lifetime. They, they apply equally to testamentary trusts because all we're doing is that any assets that are held in a trust structure, be it intervivos or a testamentary trust, any income generated from that can be split and distributed to different people within the class of beneficiaries and they would get taxed at their normal marginal tax rates on top of whatever they're already earning. So the tax planning opportunities in relation to normal family discretionary trusts equally apply to testamentary trusts with the added benefit that minor beneficiaries of a testamentary trust will be treated like normal adult taxpayers. What, do this, what does this actually mean? Um, certainly, you know, accountants out there that do these tax returns for clients with fam existing family trusts would know. If you have a normal inter vivos trust established, you know, it's, it's basically established during somebody's lifetime, it's not being created via a will or pursuant to somebody's death, an inter vivos trust, any income of that trust distributed to minor beneficiaries, you can only distribute $416 every income year for it to be tax free. Anything over that will be taxed of at least 45%. So essentially it's a penalty tax rate to stop people from basically shelving all the assets in a trust and then they just split the income between all sorts of people in their family, minors, you know, somebody that's just been born they're splitting the income, even though those minors are not the ones that have earned the income. Now, that rule, that earned income rule, does not apply to testamentary trusts. 
So these are trusts that have been established pursuant, somebody's, pursuant to somebody's will. The premise is, you know, somebody has to, has to have actually um, died before you get the tax, tax planning opportunities of the testamentary trust. Minors of testamentary trust, if you distribute income to them, they get treated like normal adult taxpayers with, you know, the 18,200 tax-free threshold every single year and um, marginal tax rates, normal adult marginal tax rates on top of that. So to get an understanding of how effective this is, I'll run through a factual scenario. So these, these are, here's a little diagram here. Um, Pat and Norma are a married couple. Um, they've got two kids, Bob, son Bob, daughter Bet. Um, Bob himself has three minor children. Just remember these names because um, I'll keep on going back to this example and this family as I work through different estate planning um, scenarios for them. So say, say with Pat and Norma, okay, they're a married couple. They're happy for assets to pass to the surviving spouse. So this, this generally means that they're not, they're not concerned about asset protection in relation to the survivor. So say if Pat dies first and Norma, she repartners, okay? So that, so they're happy with assets passing to each other and then trust will only be established on the death of the second of them. Doesn't matter who dies first, two trusts will be established on the death of the second of them because there are two kids in this scenario. There's two trusts, so Bob's trust, Bet's trust. Um, their estate has, um, say their estate is assumed to be four million. They established the two, the two testamentary trusts and if it's two, it's four million, that means there's two mil going into each of these trusts. Um, I've made an assumption here, say the return is 3%, bit of a conservative return, 3%, that will generate a two mil capital asset that's gone in there would generate about $60,000 of income a year. Now say in this example, Bob's actually, he's 35, he's a successful guy himself already, he's pretty established. Um, maybe he's a doctor, maybe he's an accountant, owns it, uh, you know, owns his own practice, or he just he just, he already owns income. Okay, so but he's got three children that are minors. Doesn't matter; they could be one, two, and three. They're under eighteen years of age. They're minors. If Bob um, is is the sole trustee, or he could be the um, one of the trustees, just in the first year of this trust being in existence alone. He could decide that with his three children, who are all under 18, distribute $20,000 each to them. That means the tax payable in this year would only be $342 each, so about $1,000 um, between the $60,000 of income that's generated. We compare this scenario to if Bob had received the $2 million inheritance direct, it, all of that income, the sixty thousand, would have been distributed. Uh, well, he would have earned it. Bob would have earned the, all the sixty thousand, and if he's already on the top marginal tax rate, forty five percent plus with the Medicare level, that's actually forty seven percent. He would have to pay twenty seven thousand dollars out of that sixty would be going to the tax man. So in this example, whether it, the states to where there's two mil that's gone into a trust and it generates this much income. The tax outcome difference is quite stark between 1,000 tax and 27,000 tax. Obviously, you can see that the more assets that would be in an estate, the more assets that would be funneling, funneling into a testamentary trust, and the longer the trust runs, the effect of this just compounds the potential tax saving that um, Bob or his family could receive. Now, a point has to be made here that estate planning is, although it's about, you know, a will that's going to come into effect when the client's died, we really need to do a bit of um, forward planning. You know, you need to get them in early, have the conversation with the client now in terms of what would be the best structure for your will. Because the trust needs to be incorporated in the will prior to the person's dying. If Bob had actually received that inheritance directly because the trust didn't incorporate, the, the, his, the will, the parents' will didn't incorporate a testamentary trust, Bob can't then take that two mil inheritance because he's received it direct. And then 
gifted into or set up a new intervivos family trust. He won't get this same outcome because of the fact that minors of intervivos trust will get whacked with the penalty tax rate. So really the take home point of this is that certainly the tax planning opportunities with trusts are equally applicable to testamentary trusts, but it has the added advantage of the minor, the minor beneficiaries being treated like normal adult taxpayers. Now, before I go on to discussing a whole bunch of different trusts that could be utilised in the state plan, there are obviously some downsides to this, you know. Not every client that walks through your door will, um, will it be appropriate for them to recommend a trust, nor um, would they be interested in it. A lot of people are just uh, put off by it due to the complexity. Um, it, is, it is somewhat complicated because in the sense that in your will, you know, it's got to have the trust will take effect from your death, but the trust terms have to all be incorporated in your will documents. So some of these will documents, instead of being a few pages, then do get on to quite a few pages, like 30, 40 pages, depending on how many trusts you have. Some people have four trusts because they've got four kids. Somebody have, some people have rolled in a special disability trust in there, and others have cascading trust arrangements, which I'll discuss as well. So there's certainly, there's a complexity element there that's a little bit off-putting. Um, to clients and there's there's a bit, as the advisor, there's a education um, opportunity there for you to try to educate them the benefits of it and why the complexity is necessary because certainly the very first example where I told you off where the bankrupt son who's lost out on his $800,000 inheritance certainly would have felt that the complexity is um, fine and all well warranted considering how much he would have received if, if you know, if the trust was in place. But, but going back to this point of the complexity, it, is, um, it's a, it can get a long document. And particularly if the client is um, getting on in years, they're elderly, if there's any questions there about capacity as well, obligation on the legal advisor is obviously to have made sure you're, you're satisfied that you explain the document to them and they understood it. Um, if there's ever any question about whether capacity was an issue or knowledge or approval of the will, it's best not to wait right near the end before they try to complete the, this type of document. Um, so that's that's one aspect of it. There's obviously, there's a cost factor as well. Um, there are ongoing costs associated with, with these trust structures. Once they're set up, it is a tax entity, so a tax return needs to be done for the document, uh, done, for the, done for the trust every year. Um, so generally rule of thumb, you know, people will say if the trust doesn't have over $500,000, it's not worth, you know, it's not worth putting the assets in a trust structure um, because, you know, the administration fees would just eat into it. So there's, people say that as a rule of thumb. It, then again, it does depend on the scenario. Like if you've got, if your client comes in to see you and they've got a disabled child or they've got a spendthrift client, then they they might feel that it's better it's better some of the money goes to essentially accounting fees admin fees or whatever it is as opposed to we they get it they'll just blow the whole lot the beneficiaries so so there's there, but there is definitely there's certainly a cost element associated with the trust structure um, the third one that I've got there is that um, when it does come into place because the will makers died um, the children then don't like it. <laughs> So I've had, I've had instances where sometimes the children will come in and that they might come in to get me to explain some other will that somebody else has prepared and they don't understand, one, they don't understand it. So it's the complexity issue again, but they're also not happy with it. They're not happy with it because they'll say something like, well, you know, this, it will be the daughter that comes in and they'll say, well, my husband's really not, you know, happy with this trust because he's excluded as the beneficiary and he can't control it. Um, and, you know, he's, he's caused some friction in our marriage. So, look, the take-home point of that is that if you're having a conversation with the willmaker client, wherever possible, try to include their children in on the conversation so that they understand the reasons why, um, you, why the parents' will would incorporate a trust as, as opposed to a traditional will where the assets are being directly left to the child. Um, and, you know, explain it's really an education process, not just in relation to the ch children, but an opportunity to get the kids, the next generation in, to also have a 
conversation with them in relation to um, these are the benefits of the trust and this is why your parents, you know, your mum or your dad want to set it up. Um, but certainly, you know, that there, there is an element there where the kids will feel like they've got no control over it. Um, but it, so it's not appropriate for everybody, obviously. You, people need to understand as the advisor, these are the benefits. It's, it's very much to do with asset protection and um, tax planning opportunities, but there are obviously some cons of setting up a trust arrangement in, in a state plan as opposed to leaving directly to the kids. Um, so I'll now go through what are the different types of trust that can be utilised in an estate plan. Now, by all means, this list is not an exhaustive list of the different type of trust that you can utilise. Um, I will start with standard, fully discretionary, testamentary trust. So this is really the starting point. Most of the wills um, will be fully discretionary, and I'll go through what I actually mean by that, fully discretionary. Um, we then jump to what are generation skipping trusts, and then following on from that, we talk about cascading trusts, and then what is the cascading generation skipping trust, getting a bit of a mouthful there, um, we then go on to talk about what a hybrid trust, hybrid testamentary trust might look like. And then I'll also briefly run through what a capital protected trust is also, which is actually another form of a hybrid trust, really. So if we go back to scenario one, okay, scenario one, and I'll, I'll re repaint the facts. And this is, this, is how, this is how scenario one would work if you wanted, if the client wants a fully discretionary testamentary trust. So once again, pattern norma, happy to leave everything to each other because they, they, they might feel asset protection in relation to the survivor not repartnering. Uh, repartnering is not a risk, so they're happy to leave everything to the survivor. The two trusts will then only be established on the death of uh, the second of pattern norma, so it doesn't matter who dies first. It's fully discretionary in the sense that usually all decisions um, in relation to where income and capital will go in any given year is at the full discretion of the trustee. Um, now, in this in this type of I'm just I'm just talking about Bob's trustee. Beth's obviously got her her own trust, but with similar provisions. But in relation to her, but in relation to Bob's trust, Bob could now be the son. He was, he was an adult, 35, with his own family and minor kids. He could be the sole trustee, and he could be the sole appointor. Um, but he could also be, he, he's most likely going to be a beneficiary in relation to income and capital of the trust. So in this scenario where it's fully discretionary and in relation to Bob's trust, Bob's, Bob's probably going to be pretty happy, okay? Because if he's a sole trustee and a point or and he's also a capital beneficiary, he can basically do what he wants with the trust, even though it's discretionary because he's, he's a trustee. So he can in one year decide, I want all the income to myself or in the following year, he said, I'm just going to pull all the capital out and distribute it all to myself. So in that type of arrangement, one needs to then understand, based on what the family law rules work, this is not a very asset protective family law trust in relation to Bob because the, the control is not being watered down and the beneficiary class, well, he's, he's a capital beneficiary. So He's not going to get very much. It's still probably better than the inheritance having been left to him direct, but the argument there that because it's in the Bob's trust left from the parents' estate is not really going to work very well if he's the sole trustee, basically the sole controller, and he's also a capital beneficiary. Um, but some clients will like that, that type of arrangement for their kids because they're more interested in the tax planning opportunities, like in the earlier scenario I, I painted through where Bob's on a high income, he's got minor children, so they want to use the income of the trust to better split it between other family members, but you're not going to achieve much asset protection. You'd still get, you'd still get the creditor protection in relation to Bob, but not going to achieve much family law asset protection with this structure. All right, so then we, with each scenario, I add to it and try to make it a little bit more protective, okay? So... The first, the second one here is what's a general, well, commonly called, people call it generation skipping trust. So what would this mean for the family of Pat and Norma? Same scenario, Pat and Norma, still happy to leave everything to each other, okay? 
they, they're still on the death of the second of them, doesn't matter who dies first, they're still having the two trusts, one for each child. It generation skips because in relation to Bob's trust, you will see here, he, he, Bob could still be the sole trustee and employer at all. But the key difference here between scenario one and two is that in scenario two, Bob's only now going to be a beneficiary with respect to income. So he's not a capital beneficiary. The capital beneficiaries will only be Bob's children and his grandchildren as well. We could include that in there. So that's what it means by generation skipping. You're essentially skipping a generation. They, they, I mean, the child, the, the, the kids might be income beneficiaries or sometimes people even strip them from cap, being income beneficiaries. But the main point is that the, benef the capital beneficiaries are the people that will be benefiting from the bulk of the Pat and Norma's assets are going to be their grandkids. So in this scenario, um, family law asset protection is still is still quite good for Bob if his relationship should end in divorce or break down and there's a dispute over the assets in his trust um, and whether that should be matrimonial property um, based on the case law well he's just not he's just not ever going to be a capital beneficiary so that's that's generally um, good from a family law asset protection now I should have said earlier though because they are testamentary trust, I mean, uh, you, everything is generally still at the full discretion of the trustee, but the important um, disclaimer to that is that usually there's certain things that can't be changed, such as capital beneficiaries. So, because that's a really key point that it's the will maker's will, essentially, and the trust is being established under their will. So they should be really be dictating who the ultimate beneficiaries under that trust is. So usually there would be in any good trust precedent um, trustees do have full discretion where income and capital go, but they can't go around changing the capital beneficiary class. So that's already locked down in the will document. So that this type of scenario, um, yeah, so it, it, it tends to work when, when clients have, have a son or a daughter already. So they have children already and they're adults and they can see that they're fairly um, comfortable, they've, they've probably already got their own property um, and they can say, we well, don't really, the child really, my own child doesn't really need um, any more of this inheritance. I want to make it for the benefit of the grandkids. So this type of scenario is something that they might want to keep in mind. And obviously with larger estates as well, the larger the estate, um, that's when the will maker, the testator has a view that the income is going to be sufficient to provide for the kids for my kids if they really if they really need it um, but the capital should really be pushed down to that next generation and not to the children directly so that's that's what a generation skipping one is now I'm just going to go on to talking about cascading trust arrangements and what this means so the diagrams change a bit now this is a scenario now where we're saying that um, a trust 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 will be established on the death of, of the first of the couple. So whether Pat or, Nor Pat or Norma dies first doesn't matter. Um, trust is going to come into existence, TT1, that's what I've called it. In this example, um, Pat's died first, um, statistically more likely to happen. But So Pat, husband's the one that's died first. A trust will then get established on the death of the first of them, okay? Reasons why people would do that? Um, because it, it does, well, the one, one is it can bring forward the tax planning opportunities because it's possible that Norma got assets of her own anyway. She's got some income. She doesn't need any of the income. Um, so there's the opportunity to bring forward the tax planning opportunities to distribute that income out to Bob's minor children and Bet too, if she's got children as well. So TT1 would come into existence following Pat's death if he's the one that's died first. Now, in this example of TT1, what, do the, what does the structure actually look like? Look, the trustee and appointer could be Norma solely or could be Norma along with the kids, but it's not uncommon for the surviving spouse to be um, the sole appointor, provided that Norma um, would, could also be, Norma would also be included as a beneficiary of TT1. 
The reason why it's called cascading is because on the death of Norma or some other specified event, assets, what would happen then is assets from TT1 would collapse into two further trusts and that's when TT2 and TT3 get established. Now there's only TT2 and TT3 because in this example there's only two kids, I've kept it simple, but if there was four then what you usually have is four separate ki four separate trusts, okay? Um, so, so we've got on, on the a specified event, so usually when the surviving spouse has also died, Norma's died, TT2 and TT3 would then get established. The assets from TT1 cascades into TT2 and TT3. Um, and, I mean, the why, why would some people want a cascading trust arrangement? I've already, um, well, one of the reasons is that scenario three is different to scenario one and two where we had assets between Pat and Norma, the married couple, happy to be passed to each other. Scenario three is you're really saying that, well, your couple might come in to see you and asset protection in relation to the surviving spouse repartnering now is a concern. And what you're really trying to do is secure the inheritances for the children from the re first relationship. My point there is that the devil's really in the detail. All right. So if we go back in this example and we say, if Norma is the sole trustee and she's also a capital beneficiary of TT1, there's nothing going to be stopping her usually from pulling out all the capital and distributing it to herself. So it's um, you really got to look at the details of the drafting and especially if sometimes these things do happen if, if you know, if Norma repartners and the new partner, the new boyfriend gets in her ear and wields or exerts some influence, then these kind of things can happen. Um, so you've really got to make sure that she's either one, not the sole controller, or um, two, she's not a capital beneficiary, which I'll, I'll go into in the, next, in the next scenario, which is scenario four. There's um, the other pro of a cascading trust arrangement is that you don't then have this requirement where there are multiple TTs to start with. So if Pat dies, one, te one, one testamentary trust is established, okay? And then Norma could live for another 20 years. So then you've only ever just got the one trust for, for the first 20 years before the other two come into existence. Um, and that's, that's still quite good because some people like to not have to, the administrative burden of, you know, administering multiple trusts they're ever only going to have the one. Um, but there are some cons of this type of approach. There are some potential tax implications of having this cascading arrangement. And the issue is when the trust of TT1, the assets cascade into TT2 and TT3 and what that actually means, which I'll go into um, in another slide. But before I get into that, I'm going to expand on the concept of a cascading trust and talk about cascading generation skipping trust. So what this actually means. So scenario four is the same as scenario three in the sense that Pat's died first, one trust is already established on his death. Now in this scenario though, um, we have TT2 and TT3 coming to existence on the death of um, well, for TT2, which is Bob's trust, that would only come into existence on um, the death of Bob. That's when half the assets of TT1 will cascade into TT2. And same for TT3 in relation to Bet's family as well. Now, this is obviously a more protective, asset protective structure in, in relation to Norma, the surviving spouse, and also the children of the two of them, Bob and Bet. Because in this type of cascading generation skipping trust, what we would have is um, not only is Norma income beneficiary only, we'd have Bob and Bet as income beneficiaries only. So under this arrangement of TT2 and TT3, the capital beneficiaries of that would only be Bob's children in relation to Bob's trust and Bet's children, uh, Bet's children in relation to Bet's trust. So we've got a cascading arrangement in the sense that on the death of, of somebody or a specified event, the assets from TT1 cascade into two separate tax. And we've also got a generation skipping element to it in the sense that the capital is going to entirely skip 
um, skip the kids and go to the grandkids of Pat. So this type of arrangement, um, quite asset protective in relation to Norma, Bob, and Bet. Um, but <laughs> um, clients that come in to see you and want this type of arrangement, you really need to have a question. You really need to have a discussion with them before you even get into this. The details of this have to go through what their assets and liabilities are, because. With a lot of married couples, like Pat and Norma, depends how they hold their assets. If they hold all their assets jointly, houses jointly, other properties might be joint, shares might be joint, um, it, you're really going to have to think about if Pat dies first and he's worried about Norma repartnering or he's worried about the kids' inheritance is falling through, then you might need to actually restructure some of those assets so that there is actually some assets in Pat's estate to fund TT1 from the start. Otherwise, you're just going to have this trust because everything, but it's going to have nothing in there because Pat, Pat and Norma held everything jointly. So that's that's a something you really have to have to get your head around early on in the estate planning conversation with your clients, what assets they own, how they own it, um, and values and liabilities against it. So... I will um, go on. Earlier on in the presentation, I mentioned to you the tax implications of these cascading arrangements. Um, cascading arrangement like this um, does throw up some some potential issues, uh, being tax issues, CGT and stamp duty. So um, CGT stings not really a sting now because practice statement LA um, 2003-12 came out. And then, so that's a fairly, that's a much, that's a fairly old practice statement, but then it was the case, you know, I'm just looking for the note on it, and this is all in, in the paper, in my paper. On the 10th of April 2014, though, the ATO um, further amended that practice statement and basically confirmed, though, that how they would be administrating um, these types of arrangements where assets are currently held by TT1 and then whatever the specified event is, the cascading to the other two, if there are capital assets, wouldn't trigger a CGT loss or gain. Okay, so that, that practice statement basically cleared that up because earlier there was a little bit of uncertainty. So it, certainly when, when the asset passes from the deceased Pat into the, or Pat's legal personal representative to TT1, that did not trigger a capital gain or loss in relation to any capital assets. There was some uncertainty as when the cascading occurs and the assets are moving from TT1 to TT2 and TT3, whether it would trigger CGT or not. Um, that practice statement and certainly the revision of it in 2014 confirmed that it would not. Um, stamp duty, though, is still a problem with this type of arrangement where you have an original trust and then on some specified event you have subs subsequent trust because there is generally no exemption. Um, stamp duty laws are obviously different in each state. The stamp duty amount is roughly about 5% of the dutable value of the assets being transferred across. There's generally no exemption. So if in particular these trusts are going to hold dutable assets, and the main one is land and property, because that's a really, that's a big ticket item that's going to trigger a lot of ad valorem duty, then um, maybe consider whether the cascading arrangement is worth it or whether you start, if Pat dies first, you start with um, two, separate, two separate trusts from the outset so that then you don't have this problem down the track when either Bob or Bet dies that then needs to cascade down and there's a potential there for stamp duty to be triggered. Um, look, I'll now go on to another another type of trust scenario. With each of these, it's just getting a little bit, it's getting further and further away from the fully discretionary trust. Um, it is, this is about hybrids. Um, so really, what a, what a, what's a hybrid? A hybrid is really a trust that has a combination of discretionary and fixed or unit trust features. So in the world of estate planning, what this usually means for a testamentary trust is that um, in this scenario, again, we're taking the example where Pat's died first, we would have a trust that would be established following his death and Norma would still be a beneficiary, 
But the difference here is that she's a fixed income beneficiary. So what this means is she's a surviving spouse, she should get priority, and the will maker Pat might come in to see you and says, I don't want her if if you know if if Norma's not the sole trustee, I don't want her to be basically at the mercy of her other co trustees who would probably be her own children, to ask and beg for money each year when she wants money or needs money. So in that type of will document, we'd fix her as an income beneficiary, which would just basically mean every single year when that trust is in existence, any income has to go to Norma. So we're fixing her as the income beneficiary. The capital beneficiaries, though, would still be discretionary and would, would may include Norma, may not, but it would include the children and, and well, may not even include the children, depending on what they want, but it would definitely include the grandkids as discretionary objects to receive capital. So that's basically a very simple hybrid arrangement in terms of what that means. Now, there are, whenever ever anybody talks about hybrids, hybrid trusts, um, ATO can some, sometimes get a bit suspicious um, because people think hybrid, you're only doing it for tax avoidance or tax evasion purposes, and basically they're saying, you know, it might look dodgy. So that, that, that type of sentiment usually doesn't hold true for tr testamentary hybrids. Um, because they just the same, it just doesn't hold true. Because usually, usually what the ATO is usually concerned about with hybrids are the intervivos ones where people are purchasing, you know, they're, they're borrowing money in their own name and then using that borrowed money to acquire units in a hybrid trust. So, in this, as an example, say Pat borrowed one mil in his own name, he settles it into a hybrid trust, the trust then uses that one mil to acquire a rental property. 500 units are issued to Pat and another 500 units issued to Norma, his wife. Then the question is that what happens is that Pat, the one million's borrowed in his name and he, he might try to then deduct the entire, all the interest on the one mil borrowings and he, the question is, is that fully deductible? Well, the short of that is no because 500 of the units has been issued to Norma. So there's, there's, you know, the section of the Income Tax Assessment Act is set out there. There's also tax rulings on there, that specific one, but there's lots of tax rulings on hybrids in particular, and it does throw in a lot of um, potential problems with tax deductibility. There's franking credit issues as well, but it just, it's just generally that those type of problems are not applicable to testamentary hybrids. Um, the last type of trust arrangement that I'll go through in this presentation is really another form of hybrid. It's a capital protected trust. So this is the name, they can be called various names, but this is the type of common name that people would use in this scenario where, say, Pat and Norma have divorced, or Pat could have died, doesn't, I mean, it's the same, it doesn't matter, but Pat's now repartnered. So we're talking about blended family scenarios, not that uncommon now. Pat's repartnered, he's got a second spouse, and his priority or his, his, one of his main objectives is he wants to provide for the children from his first relationship with Norma. Okay, so what, so in this a capital protected trust, what would happen is that his spouse, Pat's second spouse, would be a fixed income beneficiary of the Pat Family Testamentary Trust. So the same arrangement again, where basically we're saying that Pat's surviving spouse would receive every single year all the income or a fixed income amount. So there's no question about it. She doesn't, the, the second spouse, particularly if she's probably not going to be, well, she's probably not going to be the sole controller and she might not even be a controller. Pat might want his adult children to be the control, controller. So Second spouse, particularly if there's some friction or they don't get along, he doesn't want her to have to be asking the stepkids for money. So that that type of this type of arrangement could be useful to have discussion with your um, test testator client about because if they've repartnered, blended family, they still want to provide income to the surviving spouse to make sure they're comfortable, but they're essentially saying capital beneficiaries will only be my children and grandkids from my first relationship with Norma. So that's when people can look at this type of arrangement um, and whether this type of structure would be appropriate for them. Um, 
And I've seen a few of these um, that we've done, that we've done as well. And this can, this can work, this type of arrangement, but one really needs to look at um, the assets that would form part of Pat's estate because um, all, all states in, New South, in Australia are obviously subject to family provision rules. So, you, you know, it really needs to look at how, what are the assets that are going to be in Pat's estate how much is he essentially providing to his second spouse? Is the income going to be sufficient for that second spouse? Because it throws in the risk there. Well, any any fa blended family, basically, there's a risk of a family provision claim because there's just so many. There's competing, conflicting interests, adult children from the first marriage, um, second spouse, and potentially new kids together with the second spouse. So there's a lot of competing interests. Um, and if the pool of assets in the estate is limited, there's always going to be conflict and problems down the track. But obviously, that's a conversation that needs to be had as to whether the income would be sufficient. And then, yeah, that's, that's really a conversation that you've got to have with your clients about that. Because the take-home points from this is really this. Um, this estate planning and certainly the use of trust. We're seeing more and more of, and I'm certainly doing more of these types of wills. It's a really exciting area because people essentially are living longer. So there's certainly issues around capacity. People are tending to repartner if they've divorced and widowed. So that blended family scenario that I've talked about can create some interesting problems because there's a lot of competing objectives and it's, it's going to be impossible. It's near impossible to satisfy everybody's interest, especially if the estate pool is limited in size. So family dynamics in this area is very important to have regard to, but it's an exciting area because it's the opportunity for you as the advisor to get in there with your clients and have these really type of juicy conversations with them. Um, the question around trust though is, as you can see from this presentation, there's certainly, there's certainly, um, a right, you know, there's certainly opportunities there to have that conversation with them early. There's lots of scenarios where it could be of benefit, whether it's, you know, family law asset protection or the tax planning opportunities. There's certainly lots of benefits to be had. There's not one trust arrangement that, you know, will suit, this client will suit the next. There's not one trust arrangement that suits all. That's when, you know, as the advisor to really add value, you've got to get in there, have those conversations with them, talk about what the competing objectives are, what the family dynamics are, and then be able to craft an estate plan that has the appropriate trust for your client. So um, that is actually the end of my presentation. Um, I'll just see whether we actually have any questions um, because now would be, I've only got about 10 minutes to run, so I've gone gone on well with time. If anybody wanted to, they could start sending in some questions and I probably have the I probably have the time to um, answer one or two questions before I wrap it up. So I see here that there's there's one question that's come in from Matt um, and his question is um, oh it's directly in relation to my last slide. His question is um, in scenario six, where you say the client has repartnered and only leaving um, the second spouse as income beneficiary, he's asking me, do you see many family provision claims um, that occur as a result of this down the track? So um, <laughs> certainly, Matt, that's a very good question. Um, but certainly, once again, you know, it's in scenario six, where you've got a blended family, um, there are just so many competing interests. So it may not be appropriate that where, where you have the surviving spouse only receives income and gets no entitlement to, to capital because you really have to look at, with your client, you really need to look at, well, how much assets is this? If the assets got five mil of assets and it generates lots of income every year, then maybe it's not it's not really concerned for the surviving spouse, the second spouse that the person's repartnered with. Um, because this area in all, in all jurisdictions of Australia really looks at, yes, it looks at relationship, but it also looks at need and whether the person has been sufficiently and adequately provided for. So um, we are seeing 
in general, family provision claims um, coming up more, more so in, in blended family arrangements because of the fact that, you know, there's just there's a lot of competing interests and the fact that estates are also getting larger, larger estates um, because, you know, property prices have boomed the last 20 years, lots of people contributing money in superannuation now. There's just a lot of wealth out there and it makes it right for disputes to happen. So, yes, definitely I'd, I'd say, we're de we, I mean, in, in relation to scenario six, I wouldn't say we're seeing more of a rise of somebody disputing that type of arrangement. I would say that there's just more there's just more family provision claims and more disputes on the rise in general. Um, and when you have when you have a situation where there's a surviving spouse and you want to use a capital protected trust arrangement, you really need to sit down with the client, go through their assets, go through how much income those assets would actually generate following their death and whether it would be sufficient to cover the, the second spouse, if you're gonna make them a fixed income beneficiary only, or whether then a conversation needs to be had as to whether you need to also carve out some capital for them, but the bulk of the capital is still earmarked for the children from the first relationship. So, all right, well, thank you very much. I think that was that's basically all the time I have for um, questions. Thank you very much. Um, it was a pleasure presenting for this afternoon's TV Ed presentation. And um, if you have any questions following from this, obviously my contact details are there and you can always shoot me an email or drop me a line. Um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in future TV Ed presentations. Thank you. Thank you everyone for participating in today's video webinar. As a reminder, we ask that you provide your feedback by completing our short survey by clicking on the yellow provide feedback icon located on the top right hand corner of your screen. Your feedback can now be provided for the next 10 minutes. Today's webinar materials can be accessed by clicking on the light blue arrow icon located on the top right hand corner of your screen. We thank you in advance for your feedback and we hope to see you at another Television Education Network presentation soon.